Hello ladies and gents, welcome to video 3 of uh, Bannockburn Month. Uh, as with so many of these videos, I am going to have to start with an apology. I am sorry that it's taken so long for video 3 to make an appearance. Uh, various issues, kind of real life pressures and so forth, have uh, prevented me from getting the, the third video up and running uh, to this point. Um, and I'm actually going to make a bit of a liar of myself in this video because in the previous video I said that next time in video 3 we would be looking at um, the landscape uh, around Stirling Castle and Bruce's plan to use that to his advantage uh, to turn that area against the English and, and come up with a, 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 a set of tactics that would um, use that landscape to his advantage. Now, that will be the next video. Um, one of the reasons why it's taken so long to get this third video up and running is that uh, it has proven kind of tricky to figure out a way to present those ideas about the landscape um, a a around Stirling Castle uh, to you in one of these videos without it not making any sense and just being me kind of rabbiting at the screen even more so than usual. Uh, <laughs> That thought process is still kind of ongoing, um, but uh, I promise the next video, which will not take too long uh, to uh, come out, uh, that's when we're going to look at the landscape. Uh, that video will be out hopefully within the next few days, certainly before uh, next Sunday, because next Sunday, the 23rd of June, is the anniversary of the first day of the Battle of Bannockburn. So on that day we will be looking at the first day, the events of that first day of the battle. The following day we'll look at the events of the second day of the battle. So between now and next Sunday, hopefully sooner rather than later, I will get that video, um, video 4 on the landscape, out um, here on YouTube for you to, um, to give it a watch. So today, instead of looking at the landscape, we are going to look at some of the key figures within um, the Scottish and the English armies. Uh, we're going to look at um, at least three from each. Um, maybe we might uh, dip into some of um, the, the sort of lower ranked individuals. Uh, there'll be far more uh, names appearing in those, those two videos of the events of the actual day, um, but for the purposes of this exercise, um, I just want to look at a, a few key individuals um, who uh, I, I think it's worth trying to kind of wrap our heads around who they are, what their motivations are at Bannockburn um, before before we go any any uh, further. Um, so, in the Scottish Army, of course, ultimate. Um, power, ultimate responsibility for the tactics and so forth that are used uh, at Bannockburn lies with the King, uh, Robert Bruce, uh, Robert Bruce King of Scots, King Robert I of Scotland, Robert the Bruce, whatever you want to call him, uh, Bruce is the man who is in charge in the Scottish army and, and um, the book stops uh, with him. It's up to him to figure out what this army is going to do, how this army is going to fight the battle uh, that is um, fast approaching by this point uh, in 1314. Now Bruce, um, as we have seen in previous videos, uh, has been uh, fighting his war against the English. He's been King of Scots for uh, eight years at this point. He's been fighting tooth and nail to try and get that um, recognised by the English and their supporters in uh, Scotland. And for the last seven of those eight years, he has uh, more or less been winning. Things have been going pretty well for him. Um, he's been gaining momentum in his struggle uh, against the English. Um, and he has developed, in the course of that time, um, quite a fearsome reputation as a war leader. Um, he has certainly become known as a very difficult opponent. Um, you know, uh, so, someone who, who uh, is quite uh, fearsome and quite tricky in the way that they um, prosecute the war effort. But it is important to remember that um, by 1314, his reputation is as a guerrilla leader. 
Um, he is not famed as someone who fights lots of pitched battles in very tricky, clever, um, difficult to overcome ways. He is famous for someone who avoids fighting pitched battles in very tricky and clever ways and who then manages to achieve um, significant military victories, um, whether that's the taking of castles or the overcoming of um, enemy forces through slightly shifty, slightly sort of shady means. Now this is very important to bear in mind when uh, we think about the Battle of Bannockburn because I think it's sometimes lost um, when people discuss the Battle of Bannockburn that um, the it, it's quite easy for the English army that comes north in 1314 to believe that if all they can do is get Bruce on the battlefield and make him fight the kind of pitched battle that he's been avoiding for the last eight years, they can beat him. They can get him. So far, Bruce has made them play his game, and if only they can get him to play theirs, or force him to play theirs, then they can win. Um, this, I think, is going to be very important to bear in mind when we look at uh, the landscape and we look at Bruce's plan in the next video, because I would argue that part of the brilliance of Bruce's tactics at Bannockburn is that he has worked into his plan that expectation that the English come to Bannockburn with. Uh, now, although Bruce has ultimate responsibility for the, the tactics used at Bannockburn, um, he cannot run this army on his own. Uh, there's no radio, there's no walkie-talkies in 1314, um, so at the end of the day, the basic decision-making, the stuff that happens in the moment, uh, has to be undertaken by sub-commanders, and there are various levels going down um, through the structure of both armies, both the English and Scottish armies, where those decisions have to be made. Um, and of course, one of the big differences between Bruce's army and Edward's army is that most of the people going down that ladder in Bruce's army are men like Bruce uh, himself, men who have been fighting this guerrilla war for seven, eight years, who are very experienced, lots of them are young, ambitious, eager to sort of prove themselves, um, th pr prove themselves not just on the battlefield, but prove that they can be of use to this new um, up-and-coming uh, Bruce regime trying to carve out for themselves a position within this new administration, this this new Scottish political community perhaps that Bruce is um, starting to form around himself. Uh, chief among these in the Scottish army at Bannockburn are of course the King's brother, Edward Bruce, um, who as we've seen in previous videos had recently been made the Earl of Carrick before that uh, he had also been made the Lord of Galloway, so a very important um, figure uh, within uh, the, the uh, Bruce administration. He is, of course, the King's heir. If anything had happened to Bruce, um, it would have been Edward uh, Bruce who became the new King of Scots. Uh, so he is going to be commanding one of the big subdivisions of um, our Scottish army at Bannockburn. Um, and he, of course, was responsible for the, uh, the pact that had brought the two armies together um, in, in June 1314. But the other big uh, subdivision of our Scottish army um, is going to be led by the King's nephew, another senior kinsman um, of, of uh, King Robert. Uh, this is Thomas Randolph, the Earl of Murray. Uh, now Randolph, like Edward Bruce, had, it seems, been with Bruce at the very start. Um, Edward Bruce, had remained with Bruce, uh, with King Robert that is, right the way through um, the, the eight years um, that, that uh, Bruce has been uh, fighting with the English by 1314. Thomas Randolph, however, has had a little bit of a waver early on. He seems to have been captured at the Battle of Methven in 1306, um, and for at least a wee while after that was to be found uh, serving the English. Um, the reasons for this are somewhat unclear. I would suggest probably the most likely explanation is that uh, he is given the option, well, you can either uh, switch sides or you can languish in jail or we can hang you. Um, it's, it's probably 
somewhat, um, to what extent is, uh, is not clear, but probably um, under duress. Um, the later Scottish explanation, the, the, the explanation provided by uh, my boy John Barber in the 1370s that uh, Randolph was uh, uh, found the kind of um, the guerrilla warfare, the guerrilla tactics that Bruce was using somehow unsavory, uh, I think is probably best explained as being Barber writing to his own times. Um, writing to the the, the uh, rivalry at that point between uh, the the Black Douglases and and um, the the uh, Dunbar Earls of March, who were um, uh, Randolph's descendants, uh, I think probably Barber is is playing into those um, contemporary. Um, rivalries and, and uh, not necessarily reflecting um, Randolph's own uh, circumstances when he's captured in, in 1306. Uh, anyway, uh, by uh, 1308, 1309, Randolph is back on side and whatever may have motivated his, his time in uh, English allegiance, uh, certainly it doesn't seem to have dampened uh, King Robert's enthusiasm for his dearest nephew, as, as Randolph is usually uh, identified in, in official documentation um, from, from Bruce's reign. Uh, because in 1312, even, even before, uh, Edward Bruce has been granted the, the Bruce Earldom of Carrick, um, Thomas Randolph has been created Earl of Murray. Um, there had been Earls of Murray previously, but the, the title and the lands had been, well, the title at least, had been uh, vacant, um, but the, the Earldom of Murray is essentially recreated for uh, Thomas Randolph, uh, the king's nephew, in 1312. And in material terms at least, in terms of actual wealth, in terms of, you know, the size of the, uh, the Earldom and the, the, the revenue it generates, um, it's a much more lucrative um, uh, prize, a much more lucrative um, uh, uh, grant than the Earldom of Carrick. Um, in the years after Bannockburn, we start to see that perhaps this causes some rivalry between uh, Randolph and Edward Bruce, although there's no real sign that there's um, much of that tension between the two men uh, at Bannockburn or at the time of Bannockburn. So, those are our three big Scottish commanders. Beneath these, we have various other significant figures. Um, of particular note, of course, um, someone who we've talked about before, James Douglas, um, the Black Douglas, or the Good Sir James, depending on your perspective. Uh, the King's soon-to-be uh, son-in-law, Walter Stewart. Uh, we'll look at those in more, uh, or, or the, the roles that they play, or don't play, um, maybe later on. Um, suffice to say uh, here that I would not afford them any great significant command of any significant number of men other than those who uh, they had sort of per personally brought to the battle. Um, again, we get a an indication in, in the Bruce by Barber that um, uh, Douglas and uh, Stuart had joint command of a, a, a division to themselves, um, but I would tend to agree with the historian, historian uh, Sonia Cameron, who has kind of dismissed that um, as, as being, uh, again, Barber being a product of his time, uh, speaking to the then King, Robert II, and probably uh, Douglas's illegitimate son, Archibald the Grim, um, who, as long-time uh, viewers and certainly long-time readers of the blog will know, is also a figure that um, uh, I have, uh, have some interest in. Um, so, I think that will probably do for our Scottish army. Looking across to the English army, well again, ultimate responsibility for the army, ultimate responsibility for its, its actions and for the tactics it tries to use against Bruce falls to Edward II, um, a much maligned king in the grand scheme of things, certainly um, in retrospect, in hindsight, um, when, when viewed as a whole, um, his is not a particularly spectacular reign. Um, it is perhaps fair to say that by the metrics 
um, that we usually judge kings. Um, Edward II is not a great one, um, but uh, because of that, uh, he sometimes comes in for a great deal more flack than he really deserves, and a lot of the problems that he suffered during his reign um, uh, are, are often kind of blown out of proportion, I think, and, and more blame is, is placed on him uh, for them than is perhaps uh, due. Uh, Edward II uh, has ruled from almost ruled England for almost as long as um, as Bruce has been king of Scots becomes king in 1307 so about a year after Bruce slightly over a year after Bruce um, but still uh, while Bruce has gradually built up um, a, a, a sense of momentum around him uh, himself um, Edward has been faced by increasing problems. Um, to some extent he has inherited some of these from his father. Um, the English have been almost at constant war um, almost since the, the 1280s. Um, they've been at war in Wales, they've been at war in Ireland, they've been at war in France, they've been at war in Scotland. Uh, sometimes all of those at the same time. Um, this is tremendously costly for um, the English uh, barony for the English nobility um, and they are sick of uh, carrying this burden both financially and in terms of actually having to go out there and lose eyes and lose arms and lose sons and whatever else lose their lives um, fighting in these seemingly endless seemingly kind of pointless wars uh, now that is undoubtedly a problem that Edward has uh, inherited from his father um, Edward doesn't generally speaking seem to be all that keen on these wars uh, but by now by by the time he he uh, takes the reins of government um, in in 1307 um, it is difficult to extricate himself um, effectively from these uh, conflicts and to do so in a way whereby he doesn't lose a great deal of prestige a great deal of territory um, he's somewhat caught between a rock and a hard place um, uh, for, for much of his reign is, is Edward II. Uh, he doesn't help himself all that much. He does have um, uh, a proclivity for favouritism. Sometimes that gets muddled up with accusations um, and claims about his uh, sexuality, which I'm not really going to go into here. Maybe that will be the source of a, a, another video, although I, I don't really feel all that qualified to comment in any great detail on issues surrounding uh, Edward's sexuality. Um, but what is crucial in terms of getting a, a handle on his kingship is the, the real um, crime that he, he commits is that he plays favorites. And that's not what a king is supposed to do. A king is supposed to be an arbiter of patronage uh, throughout the realm. He's supposed to make sure the patronage is spread um, as reasonably evenly as he can. Um, but Edward doesn't do that. He showers a great deal of attention and patronage and uh, cash and land and so forth, um, goodies on a very few people uh, who he who he really uh, likes, who he really esteems, to the detriment of the community as a whole. The community being, of course, primarily the nobility. Um, one of the people who has fallen afoul of this uh, quite badly during Edward's reign is Humphrey de Bouin, the Earl of Hereford. Um, he is another one of the significant commanders at, at Bannockburn. Um, as well as being the Earl of Hereford, he is also uh, the Lord Constable of England, the second most important military officer in the kingdom after the king. Um, and he is a veteran of um, Edward I's um, Scottish Wars. He has, he has uh, fought a great deal in Scotland. Um, and in other conflicts uh, that the English have been fighting. Um, he is uh, very experienced. Uh, he has certainly done um, fundamentally all of the things that a great magnate is supposed to in order to generate um, a steady stream of royal uh, patronage. Um, but he uh, certainly comes to feel that he has been uh, sidelined uh, by, by uh, some of Edward's favourites, particularly by Piers Gaveston. Um, some of you may recognise that name, one of, one of Edward's uh, big favourites, uh, someone who had been uh, close 
to uh, King Edward even before he was the king, even when Edward I was on the throne, and this had caused some tensions, it seems, between um, Edward and his father. Um, and in 1312, uh, frustrated by this, uh, Humphrey de Boon was one of the barons who uh, hunted Gaveston down and uh, were deemed responsible, at least by Edward II, for his extrajudicial killing. Um, they basically arrest um, uh, Gaveston. There's talk of a, a trial and maybe another exile. He'd been in exile previously, um, but it ends with Gaveston dead, and Gaveston dead at the hands of men in the employ of the likes of Hereford. As you can imagine, this does not um, do much for the relationship between Edward II and uh, the Earl of Hereford. Um, and so, when the time that Bannockburn comes along, um, Edward does not grant the most prestigious command in the army, command of the vanguard, the sort of front line of our uh, English army, uh, to the Earl of Hereford, as um, sort of tradition would dictate. Instead, uh, Edward grants it to his uh, own nephew, Gilbert de Clare, the Earl of Gloucester. And this is the last of the figures that we are, we are going to touch on here today, you'll be pleased uh, to hear. Um, Gloucester is uh, obviously a close relative of the king, his nephew, um, relatively young, um, ambitious, uh, eager. Uh, like uh, Hereford, he has been involved in um, the Scottish Wars. In fact, he's been uh, very enthusiastic in uh, uh, his involvement in Scotland, um, although he has kind of accomplished relatively little um, despite all of his uh, uh, efforts to, to kind of show willing. Um, certainly he's less experienced than Hereford is, um, and of course being one of the king's uh, close family members, uh, his appointment uh, doesn't just um, rebuke Hereford's own expectations as um, the Lord Constable, um, it also brings up um, that nasty taste of favouritism that the barons had hoped they might be able to drive out of the king um, when uh, they did off, they did away with um, with Gaveston. Uh, um, I nearly called him Gaveston, which is always a bit of a risk um, when uh, when uh, discussing this period in English history. Um, so, uh, the upshot of all this is uh, that a huge row between these uh, key figures within our English army, Hereford um, and Gloucester, erupts before they even get to Bannockburn, before they even get within sight of the battlefield, um, with uh, Hereford um, uh, determined that he should be in charge and Gloucester determined to hold on to the position that his uncle has um, granted him. And in um, a, a, another show of the kind of um, ineffectiveness um, that, that Edward is, is um, often remembered for, um, in, a, in a kind of weak attempt to try and reach a compromise, um, he, uh, Edward, this is the king, decides to give joint command, it seems, to these two men. Uh, Hereford and Gloucester, um, which of course means that if you are in the English vanguard at Bannockburn, you have no idea whose orders you are following. What happens if Gloucester signals something and Hereford sing sing uh, signals something else? What do you do? Well, who knows? Um, there's no guarantee that the commanders, the key commanders um, in that crucial group, the group that's going to meet the Scots first um, on the 23rd of June, uh, is uh, there's no guarantee that those two men are going to make the same decision, that they're going to be pulling in the same direction. Um, so, hopefully, having a look at some of these um, figures uh, has gotten across to you the kind of state of the two armies um, as they come together in June 1314. Both of them are fundamentally governed by um, ambitious, competitive, um, uh, fundamentally self-centred, I suppose, um, aristocrats. 
and noblemen, men whose life's goal is to accrue fame and fortune and to improve their own position um, at the expense of their rivals. Uh, however, that competitive, acquisitive um, uh, uh, tendency within uh, the aristocracies of the two kingdoms is considerably better balanced in Bruce's army than it is in Edward's army. Um, the individuals in uh, Bruce's army are eager to impress upon the king that they can be um, useful in this new, this brave new world that Bruce is trying to usher in, that in the new um, regime that Bruce is carving out for himself, that they um, have the right to, um, to, you know, to be part of this, um, to have a prominent position in there. And to do that, they have to prove that they can follow Bruce's orders, that they can help Bruce achieve his overall aim. Um, in Edward's army, uh, the competition is very, very fierce and very direct between the key figures within uh, the English army as a whole. They are not competing to impress the king and to prove that they can be helpful and to prove that um, they can be useful, that they can um, act independently but keep the overall plan in mind. They are eager to prove that the other guy is wrong, that they should be in charge, that they should have a better position, that they should be the, the, the focus of his attention, the focus of his patronage, um, rather than that other guy who they don't like, who they've been competing with back at home. Um, again, this is going to be crucial when we see how the two armies act on the two days. And it's going to be crucial when we see the plan that Bruce puts together ready for the battle because it is simple enough, Bruce's plan, that it can be carried out by an army consisting mostly probably of tenant farmers who have had maybe six weeks worth of training before they have to go and do this for real. But it is complex enough that it requires the people who are guiding the army through these movements, guiding the army through this plan, making sure that the plan goes off. It is complex enough that those people need to all be pulling in the same direction. Because it would not take more than two or three cock-ups here and there throughout this uh, Scottish army, more than one or two people deciding that they wanted to go off and be the hero rather than um, focusing in on that end result, uh, the thing that Bruce has been working th uh, them towards for the last six weeks. Um, it wouldn't take much for all of that to unravel and the Battle of Bannockburn to have a very different result than it had. So, ladies and gents, I'll leave you with that thought. And I will see you again, hopefully quite soon, certainly before next Sunday. Um, and we will look at what Bruce's plan is and how that uh, uses the landscape around Stirling, where, where Bruce can now guarantee that the, uh, the English army will be coming uh, to, uh, to get him, uh, how Bruce uses that landscape to his uh, best advantage, how he designs um, a battlefield. Thank you, Paul Trickett. Um, for that turn of phrase, um, how Bruce designs the battlefield um, around uh, 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 Stirling to give himself the best possible chance of achieving victory. So thank you ladies and gents, I realise that's been a bit of a long one, um, but hopefully I'll see you again for the next video.